but part of that is to do with the fact that we're delving into a landmark of the Australian Park, the history of Australian wine from 1788 to the present day. It's a romantic and magnificent story of challenges and heartbreaks told in three volumes over 1,500 pages. It's a story of young ambitions in an ancient land, the cycle of tragedies and triumphs, and the development of a truly unique and fascinating wine culture. I'd like to uh, acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wonga people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and to knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of this country. While we're a small group, just a couple of quick housekeeping requests. Uh, if everyone could just check your phones and please just make sure they're oh, good idea. Silent. That would be much appreciated. <laughs> um, you're certainly welcome to take photos and share your thoughts and pictures on socials this evening. There will be plenty of time for questions uh, at the end of the evening, but certainly if questions come out throughout the course of the evening, uh, by all means, uh, please um, flag those. We are recording this evening's events. Um, so when we do come to questions at the end of the discussion, uh, just for the benefit of the online audience, we're just going to repeat those questions. So if you can just hold, we'll come to the repeat of those questions uh, towards the latter part of the evening. The event bar is open throughout the course of the evening, which is outside, and the event bookstore is just at the rear, and bathrooms are also out of the rear of the room. And W. Marshall Wine is the author of several books, and Files for Awards of Patience, six editions, Imagining Kunawara, A Travel Through Time, Mark the Riscar, Spanish speaking people here tonight. Uh, the Essence of Dreams, The History of Mornington Dinosaurs, The Wine Industry, and co authored educational books, Australian Wine and A Taste Around the World of Wine. Andrew also co founded Langton's and has been a leader in the wine industry for over 20 years. Andrew is also the editor of the Wine Journal, which draws on Andrew's periodical publication, The Vintage Journal, containing research experience and tasting expertise gathered during over 40 years working in the secondary market, the corporate retail world, the wine media, film, and painting. For all of our events, we generally do have host interviewers, but it's unusual that we are um, uh, have the benefit of the publisher as a guest host to delve into this extraordinary tone. We're thrilled to welcome and have Dave Longfield in conversation with Andrew this evening. David uh, founded Longfield Media, a Sydney-based publisher, celebrating its 24th anniversary this year. Renowned for producing acclaimed and award-winning books, the portfolio includes academic works, organisational and government histories, and study and coffee table books. Uh, I should also uh, acknowledge that uh, co-publisher Dr Angus Houston, who's not here with us this evening, and also publisher of the Vintage Journal, um, sends his apologies. But, you're in for, I think, a very enjoyable, relaxed evening. Um, please give a very warm welcome to Andrew and Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. We're going to begin the evening with a brief interlude because we are airing the first section of this discussion at the Australian Embassy in Dublin. So I'd like to begin with a welcome to our distinguished guests in Dublin. Uh, Deputy Ambassador, <laughs> um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Andrew, time to embarrass you with yeah. some quotes at the moment oh, yes. to start with. This book has been described as a masterpiece by the industry statesman Brian Crozer, genuinely majestic and indeed monumental by Australian Broadcasting Corporation Chair Kim Williams, and probably the finest book I will get to review in my lifetime by Tanzan Curran of Jancis Robinson's website. Um, it's also been shortlisted for the best wine book in the world at the upcoming Gourmand Awards for 2024. And uh, behind this work is 20 years of research and experience, two years of publishing where we've worked together. Um, the result is half a million words, 1,300 images and 1,760 pages over three volumes. Now, this is a work of Australian history and you've got a very strong English accent. Yeah. How did that come about? Yeah, well, what's, it's wonderful everyone here, and, and I know a few faces, so some people know where, where I come from. Uh, I was born and educated in the UK, but my mother was uh, what's still alive, just, um, is Australian. And her, her family uh, were vignerons uh, in South Australia. They first came to 
South Australia in 1838 and uh, established Ranella and uh, became very important for vignerons during the 19th century. And uh, so when I grew up in England, uh, we always heard about the stories about the Rennells and um, the tragedies. There were a lot of them within the family um, and a lot to, um, to, to, to be anxious about because we, we, we were never going to be as good as, as uh, our grandparents and our great-grandparents. Um, but it was, really their, it was really their history and my mother's absolute love for Australia that actually um, encouraged me to come out, come out here to Australia as a young man. And I specifically said Australian history data because yeah. although this, yeah. is, this is a wine book, yeah. it's, it's not just a history of wine, is it? No, it's, it's really a, a history of Australia through the prism of wine and viticulture. And I, and I think I didn't really know what I was doing when I started. And the, the, you know, the idea behind the book originally uh, was uh, to update a book by Dr. Max Lake called Classic Wines of Australia, which he produced in uh, 1966. And a part of that work is actually integrated into the book, and we can talk about that um, um, a little a little bit um, later on. But he was um, he was he probably wrote the very first book, which really showed an absolute love um, for Australian wine and its potential as a fine fine wine producing country. And I knew Max because he was a very good friend of my grandmother. And in fact, I was. Uh, sifting through some drawers while we were going through our, our um, in, um, you know, publishing phase and found a letter from Max Lake to, to, to my grandmother. And uh, he, had, he was writing about a weekend at my grandparents' property down in southern New South Wales, a place called Holbrook, a place called Mount Annan. And uh, it was about a five-page letter of tasting notes of all the things that they were tasting, things like 1908, Chateau Ranella, um, you know, kind of old Lafitte's and stuff, but a lot of the old wines, Morris and Shea, Mount Pleasant's and stuff like this. And I realised actually that, uh, that Max Lake's book, Classic Wines of Australia, a lot of the, the, the experiences he had with those old wines were actually through um, his friendship with my grandparents. And so I suppose um, in terms of, you know, what I was kind of, you know, kind of looking at when I was writing this, this history was that it couldn't just be a wine book, you know. I, I, I actually find wine books really boring and I can't read them um, for much um, because it's always about the wine. And I think the people are far more fascinating and more enduring. And, and so it was really about the ambition that I found the most fascinating and that's why, why I went that way. And then you were, um, David was not only the co-publisher but he worked also as an editor. So um, he would say, you can't write that. And um, there were all those kind of things that were going through as well. Right? It was a very yeah. satisfying process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we worked very hard to keep as much as possible in Australia yeah. for this. My, my editor lives in France, but apart from that, yeah. what, what was your ambition for Australia? Well, um, as many of you know, uh, China put on a 212% um, tariff on, um, on Australian wine. Uh, and this happened you know, during the COVID period. And I was witnessing a lot of families suffering, and, um, and I knew that that would um, flow on to, to some larger problems which the wine industry is having now. And I felt very strongly, if I'm going to write a book about Australian wine and be um, really true to, to the book itself, that we needed to um, publish the entire book within Australia and have it printed in Australia. And if anyone knows how much it costs to print a book in Australia, and then you look at the size of this book, um, it was a very, very big decision to make. I mean, a normal publisher wouldn't have done that, right? But it was a, published, it was a decision that... It was a strategic that, decision. Yeah, it was, it was a strategic yeah. decision as much as a, a moral, moral yeah. um, decision in, in my, my yeah. view. Um, I go to China a lot, and I, I know a lot of Chinese people, and they're, and they're wonderful people, um, and I have no problem. But it's just, it's just the optics would have looked really bad, in my view, if we hadn't printed it in Australia. Now, there are a few Irish connections in the yeah, book. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we have talked about the Irish connections to, uh, for our um, Irish audience. And, yeah. and actually, our, Ireland does play a big part in the story of Australian wine. I mean, a lot of uh, Irish people came out to Australia. And really, I mean, although there were, there were some that came out with the first fleets, you know, in, after the uh, 1798 Irish Rebellion, uh, there were about four, four or five hundred um, Irish. Men that were that were transported out to 
uh, New South Wales. And, um, and they landed up working on farms and vineyards around Rose Hill, around Parramatta. And um, uh, the Irish Rebellion um, uh, ended in, in uh, 1798 um, with um, the Vinegar Hill, um, that Battle of Vinegar Hill, um, near Rexford uh, in, in Ireland. And, um, and uh, they called it the Second Battle of Vinegar Hill in 1804, um, in which um, the Irish um, kind of workers and labourers, convicts and everything, um, uh, went into uh, rebellion and the New South Wales Corps, um, you know, kind of quashed it. And at the same, in that rebellion, actually, um, Samuel Marsden, who was known as the flogging pastor, or, um, uh, you know, he was an awful person um, uh, and uh, had a, um, a real hate for Roman, Roman Catholics. Um, and being a Roman Catholic, I hate him too. Um, but uh, anyway, he, he actually, um, uh, the MacArthur family, who, who were uh, um, living uh, um, around Rose Hill, at the time, uh, at Elizabeth Farm, uh, they were under, under mortal danger. In fact, Samuel Marsden saved uh, William MacArthur, who we're going to talk about a bit later, um, who was a young boy from, from getting, uh, getting really hurt. And then the, the Irish, you know, kind of filter right through the story. I mean, if anyone knows much about Australian history generally, the Irish, you know, played a, a very, very big part in all sorts of, you know, one of the uh, most famous, um, you know, kind of, of Irish descent was Ned, Ned Kelly, of course, uh, who was a very famous bush ranger. But there was a, um, there was a guy um, uh, called Gleeson who, um, who, who uh, went up into the Clare, the Clare Valley and named, named the area Clare Valley after County Clare. And he owned uh, 150,000 acres of leasehold land. So to put that into context, that's 610 um, um, 610 square kilometres of land that he controlled in South Australia. I mean, it was just absolutely extraordinary. And when he arrived in, in uh, South Australia in 1838, so the same year as my, my forebears, uh, he came in from Madras, India, with 24 Indian servants and also um, with um, a collapsible, you know, kind of house, you know, um, you know kind of pre prefabricated house right. so that he could immediately live in it. So if there's, if there's one particular story that stands out to you out of all these half a million words, what would that be if you put you on the spot? Um, oh, God, there's so, so many. I, mean, um, I think perhaps one of the most fascinating really is the extent of Australia's export market into the UK during the 1880s, 1890s and 1900s. It's absolutely fascinating. And to understand the ambition as well. You know, we all, everyone talks within the wine industry that we all came from a, uh, a fortified um, wine culture, and we don't. You know, there's an advertisement in um, a newspaper, a Sydney um, newspaper in the 1850s, which is advertising 19, sorry, 1824, Camden Park, Red Burgundy, first growth. You know, I mean, that just gives you an idea about what the ambition was, was to make really high quality, you know, kind of, kind of wine. And it just got lost in the fray. And it got, it got lost in the fray because, um, you know, there's at least one generation, not, if not two generations, of both Australians and, uh, and UK people who have just forgotten, just forgotten what was happening. So I think that's fascinating. But it's not the only thing. There's just so many different, you know, there are very amusing things, you know, like... Um, Mark Twain and uh, Anthony Trollope going into um, um, into into um, you know into the various wineries and visiting wineries, and I don't know if anyone's any, ever read anything of Anthony Trollope's, and I just got, I just can remember the quote, so I've got it written down here, which is a and it's a really it's a really great one, um, and uh, you know he wrote in this book in 1876. I've drunk fairly good wine in Australia, but none in Queensland. Here in these pages, truth must prevail, and I'm bound to say that Queensland wine was not to my taste. I'm delighted to acknowledge that their pineapples were perfect. <laughs> and, you know, you know, those are the kind of things that are surprising, but also give you an idea about the flavour of this book. It's not bore. Well, I'm hoping it's not boring, because while I was writing this book, I was always thinking about the poor person, you know, that this wine geek might be married to or partnered up with, 
and I was thinking, if he's going to be reading or she reading it in bed, then there's got to be lots of illustrations <laughs> because, you know, you know, all of those kind of things. And there's got to be something that, um, you know, kind of persuades uh, people that, you know, wine is just more than a drink, that it's, it's something very cultural. Yeah. And, and we did work hard, didn't we, over many months to make this book as accessible as possible, as you're saying, by having various types of editorial, breakout quotes, yeah. um, mini biographies of people and wines, yeah. um, and an image on basically every page. Yeah, that's right. Several. And, yeah. and in fact, we got into trouble for it financially, right? Because um, this whole book project is a not-for-profit project. Um, so just to put this in your mind, it's cost a million dollars to produce. We didn't know it was going to cost a million dollars to produce, but that's basically what it's been. And we raised money um, um, through friends, family, and wine industry friends, people that might have you know, fairly deep pockets, uh, to be quite honest, because we knew it was going to be a big pro project, and doing it through COVID, not everyone was traveling that brilliantly well. And I wrote uh, 22 emails, um, and we raised $320,000 within a couple of weeks, which is pretty good. Um, and then uh, we started running out of money again, and so we had to go and try and find it. And, and you know, to give you an example, we weren't particularly aggressive of trying to raise the money. And I was sitting next to Jerry Ryan at Richleton, um, who um, is quite a, um, an entrepreneur, and, and uh, I've never met him before in my life. And he was saying, what are you doing? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I'm writing this book. And I barely spoke, spoken, you know, kind of three sentences and four sentences. He said, I'll help you with that. So he put in, you know, kind of 50 grand, which was brilliant. Um, you know, pen poles, you know, were absolutely superb as well. So we managed to, to, to do it as, a, as that as a project. But the problem um, with it, with David and myself, is we're always finding all these great images. And at the same token, I was getting getting kind of information back from anger saying, shit, you haven't written on this or that. And, you know, someone's getting cranky about this or that. So it went, it went um, from what was budgeted as 1,200 pages up to 1,750. So basically an extra 30% of the cost, right? To make it the definitive. To make uh, it what it is now. As, yeah. as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Um, well, look, I think we might say farewell to Ireland yeah. at this point. Goodbye. For the moment. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, we'll continue our conversation Brilliant. in the room. Yeah, yeah. yeah. fantastic. Yeah. But yes, I hope you all have a lovely evening there back in Dublin. And uh, thank you, Harshal, for, for putting it together. We really appreciate it. Yeah. So Harshal's uh, uh, um, uh, lived in, Aust in Australia for a long time and we knew him. And he came to the launch in, uh, in London and he said, I, I, I'd like, like to do the launch in Ireland by me. And, um, and so he's organised to do it at the Australian Embassy in, in Dublin uh, through his contacts, which is very, very generous. So thank you very much. Yeah, great. So look, I, I don't know how many of you have seen yeah. the book. I know some people in the room have. Just a quick breakdown of the structure before we get into the detail. Um, volume one is Australian colonial wine. So from 1788 to 1900, essentially which, the which first Which is the cover of this, this, this book yeah. here. So that's it. So the cover is uh, um, by uh, a painting by a guy called William Barrack, who was an Aboriginal um, who worked at uh, Yeringbo. And um, he painted this when he was a very old man and uh, sent it back to um, the Tapiri family back in Switzerland, saying that he really he missed, missed him. And this was his image of, uh, of, uh, of the vineyard. And I actually, um, Max Allen was the guy who actually um, uh, made me aware of this painting about uh, 10, 15 years ago, and I always had in the back of my mind that it would be a brilliant cover for a book if we were going to do a history of Australian wine. So, so there it is. So it's wonderful to have. The actual painting is still in Switzerland. Yeah. And then volume two, yeah. um, Federation to the Modern Era from 1901 to 1982, yeah. which has uh, Gary Shedd, The Retinue of Dionysus, yeah. on the cover. Yeah, that's right. And, um, um, and this, uh, Gary Shedd is a very famous... Uh, um, Australian painter. His uncle was actually Morris O'Shea, mm -hmm. and so it's very appropriate that he should be in. But Morris is in the back page, not yeah. front. He's he's this uh, guy guy here, and it's a really wonderful um, series of series of paintings. And uh, it was the absolutely perfect thing to have. And then volume three, which takes a bit of a departure from the other two historical volumes because this covers Andrew's experience and time in the industry, which yeah. is why there's an odd 
break in the middle of a decade for their time yeah. frames. So this is probably the most controversial for and for some of you who are in the wine trade here might find it a bit controversial. It's not really, but it's it's a it's a personal yeah. perspective. So the cover is actually by a guy called um, by the painter Fred, Fred Williams who died in nineteen eighty two. Um, and I've always loved his, loved his paintings, and it just turns out this painting is actually owned by Ros Packer. And Ros Packer is one of the, uh, and I've kind of known her for many, many years. And, um, and so it's kind of pretty neat that, uh, that that painting should be there, and, and that one of the patrons of the book is, um, uh, actually owns it. It um, makes it extra special. So the, the, the volume three, we probably won't talk much about volume three. Just, uh, we can talk about it if you want to ask questions about it, but it's very, very contemporary times. And it's not really a, a straight history because, um, um, you know, kind of looking back through, through time, uh, I was a protagonist um, or a participant or an observer uh, in many of the kind of things that were happening by virtue of the fact that I was a... Um, a wine auctioneer and trying to, 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 to build a business. And so I spent a lot of time in the field with winemakers that have become very famous and uh, been involved in a lot of projects um, that uh, have subsequently become fairly well known. So I knew a lot of the, the protagonists um, and you know some I knew extremely well and they were good friends and other people I knew extremely well and I, they wouldn't have considered me a very good friend. <laughs> but, um, but saying that, I think... Um, I, in terms of how I, I approached it, was I approached it at their body of work rather than whether I liked them or not. And I don't think there's ever uh, anything in this book that uh, puts down anyone or for the because there's no reason. Because some of those, you know, in that competitive environment um, where people are trying to protect their patch and do all those kind of things or trying to try and pursue an agenda and then see you coming in with things like Langston's classification of Australian wine, which really annoyed Len Evans hugely when it first came out. Um, you know, those kind of things, you know, kind of stirring the possum doesn't make you the most, uh, you know, popular person all the time. But saying that again, um, just looking back through the whole, you know, kind of, um, you know, kind of 40 years or whatever, um, you know, there's some extraordinary human beings. And, you know, if you have a people like Halliday, for instance, you know, and Halliday and I have had um, a, you know, kind of mixed kind of relationship over the 40 years. He got me the job at Brokenwood in 1984 um, and was really fantastic. And then, I, you know, it, then things weren't so fantastic. But I've seen a, a lot of him over the, over the years. But he, he, he actually got, uh, got a copy of the book and sent me a text and said it's triumph. And I, you know, that that's something that's not very holiday like, right? Um, but um, you know, that absolutely blew me away because um, to have that acknowledgement from somebody whose body work is just phenomenal, and and he will see in this book that I'm absolutely standing on his shoulders. I mean, he was doing a lot of history stuff when um, when uh, it was the analog years. You have to go into a library, and I'm sure he had some researchers trying to help him find bits and pieces. But uh, these days on digital. Um, you know, you can find a piece of, uh, you know, a newspaper article written in 1843, um, you know, on a particular date or whatever. You can find it within seconds. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, a book like this could never have been written with, without having, you know, that kind of access to digital access information. To yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, we've, we've stepped ahead into that, we, which is great, have, but yeah. I would like to take you back yeah. to the 1824 period in Camden Park and William MacArthur because... Yes. To my mind, when I was working through the book, this is, it, it's quite an astounding period, and he was quite an amazing man. Yeah, he, he was. Um, you know, a lot of people think of uh, James Busby as being the father of the wine industry, and he was really, he was an important person, there's no question. And, and it, it's fair to call him the father of the wine industry in terms of, you know, the vine stock material that came in in 1832. You know, a lot of that is the foundation of our, our fine wine industry. So a lot of these old vines, surviving old vines in South Australia, Shiraz, Grenache, uh, you know, they, those are examples, particular examples of um, um, you know, genetic vine stock um, that goes back to, to Busby, as does MV6, Pinot Noir, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, he, he, was a, he was a peculiar man. Um, you know, he was born in Scotland, um, and in fact, it was him who actually, um, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, enrolled his father for his job, you know, as a, as a surveyor here in, in New South Wales. He was very, very pushy, and very ambitious. 
And uh, at a very young age, she wrote that uh, treatise, which was a which was a plagiarized work of Chaptal on you know kind of on on you know kind of how to plant vines and, and make wine. Um, and when he was as a young man, you know, in 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 the eighteen in the eighteen um, you know twenties and stuff like that, he was moving around vine stock and selling vine stock and stuff like that. So it was quite important. And then, um, and then, you know, he felt more entitled than, he, than you know, the jobs that he got from the colonial government. So he went back to the UK to, to try and get himself a new job. But in fact, uh, a part of the reason why he went to Europe also was um, to find vine stock material um, that the MacArthur's thought they'd brought in in 1817, but hadn't because there was some fuck up in London with a nurseryman. Um, with some stuff that, they, that the MacArthur family had brought in, you know, around um, France um, in, in 1815. And, um, and you know, they, they, you know, they were getting their, you know, the, the ship, which was a convict ship, prepared. Uh, they got a greenhouse on board and all this kind of stuff. And they left, they left vine stock in the care of a nurseryman in London. And so when the time was to, to, to come out to, to, to New South Wales um, in 1817, um, the nurserymen then you know, put the vine stock into, into, into the, uh, the greenhouses and all this kind of stuff. And then when it was planted uh, at Camden Park um, in 1817, uh, it took three years before they actually got a crop. And it was only three years later they realized that they didn't get what they'd actually been collecting in France, and it must have been um, absolutely devastating for their for our, their ambitions, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, James Busby went off and he did his uh, tour of uh, of Spain and and, and and France, but he was only uh, when he came back to to um, New South Wales, he supposedly bought uh, four hundred and thirty seven varieties, and they came from uh, Montpellier. Um, uh, they came from the Luxembourg Gardens, um, and they came from Sion House. And actually, very few people know that there was another collection that came from Spain, but the collection from Spain um, didn't arrive um, in good condition. All the vine stock was dead. They couldn't do anything with it. But, um, you know, it was not properly catalogued. Um, but a part of the reason for that was the guy, I think it's, I can't remember if it was Montpellier or Luxembourg, but one of the guys who was the nurseryman in Montpellier was an absolute prick. And he didn't really, you know, he was really happy to to give, you know, give mislabeled, you know, kind of stock saying it's this, and 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 he he had a reputation for that kind of stuff. So it wasn't really James Busby's fault that um, that there was a lot of miscataloging, but a whole lot went into the Botanic Gardens, Sydney Botanic Gardens, um, and then you know they talked about his private collection going up to Curtin up in um, the Hunter Valley. And then there was a, 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 another part of the collection, which was really another private collection that went down to Camden Park. Now, the stock that went into to, 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 um, the Hunter Valley is really interesting in terms of its history of MV6. Um, but in terms of... And, 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 but Might just elaborate on MV6. Yeah, yeah or, or MC, yeah. MV6 or Pinot Noir. But we, yeah. we can talk about that um, a little bit later. Yeah. But um, a lot of the buying stock was distributed around the Hunter Valley. But where the big difference with Camden Park was that Camden Park um, landed up being the place, um, you know, kind of ground zero for the Australian wine industry because they, they, they uh, William MacArthur was sending out vine cuttings down to, well, we know that, 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 um, that the first uh, vineyard established at um, 1848 down in, um, down in, sorry, yeah, 1838, sorry, 1838, I think? I can't remember this. 1838 or 48. Um, uh, was um, was material that was sourced from from Camden Park, so that's Yering Station, and there was an enormous amount of stock that was um, that was also um, distributed to to South Australia. So the families like the Hardys, um, the Rennells, uh, John Rennell was in correspondence with uh, William MacArthur. I mean, William MacArthur was an amazing human being. He's he's pictured he's he's depicted in the Australian um, Dictionary of Biography. As being this um, this uh, lunatic, basically, who's you know, um, you know, prone to to being you know, kind of angry and all that kind of stuff. But that sounds more to me like John MacArthur, not mm. William MacArthur. William MacArthur sounds like the most gentle, extraordinarily well, um, you know, well-read. He could speak French. He could speak Latin. 
Uh, he was in correspondence and he actually had, you know, dined with, uh, with Charles Darwin. Uh, he wrote um, these long missives on how to, how to write, about how to, make, how to plant vineyards, how to, how to make wine. Um, he was an extraordinary person, but because of his, his family fame under the MacArthur name, he, he wrote under the name of Morrow. And it's really interesting how history has shaped James Busby as the father of the wine industry. But he was the father in the sense that he brought out a very important, but he didn't bring out bringing the only vine stock, but it was William MacArthur who was the parent. You know, James Busby went to New Zealand at the age of 32, which is pretty young, right? And he never really came back. And he was very much involved with the Treaty of Waitangi. Mm -hmm. But what's also interesting about James Busby, who was appointed the first resident uh, of New Zealand, um, you know, is that, that he, he got that job because another guy, uh, Collett Barker. So the two wine regions that we all know, little places in Western Australia, Mount Barker in Western Australia and Mount Barker in the Adelaide Hills, are named after Collett Barker. So Collett Barker was, um, he, 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 he was... Uh, a uh, commandant of a, of, a, of a convict settlement up in the Adelaide River, uh, up in the Northern Territory, which is now Darwin. And then he had to move, move uh, the convicts down to, to southwest, um, um, to the Swan River colony, down near Mount, Mount Barker. And then he, he got tapped on the shoulder because he was uh, invited to be the first resident of uh, New Zealand. And then when he was travelling back, and he went by Adelaide, he was foraging around... Uh, the River Murray, and he got speared by an Aboriginal, and um, and that was curtains for him, uh, and that um, allowed Busby to become first resident of New Zealand. That's very, very uh, not 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 particularly well known. It, it is extraordinary the number of vines that were moving around the country, and if I can just step forward to yeah. the exhibition of eighteen fifty, yeah, fifty five, yeah. So, um, what? Why was that a turning point? In our well, the 18, 1850, the very first ex international kind of mm -hmm. exhibition. Um, what we would call an international expo today was um, was in 1851, um, and that was um, organised by uh, Prince Albert and um, and a few other people, uh, and it was a massive success. And of course, in those days, you know, kind of nations were trying to outdo each other, and so um, uh, there was another exhibition that took place in 1855 um, in in Paris. And for those wine aficionados out there, which you all know, um, you know, it was a very, it was a very, very important um, uh, exhibition for wine because it was when um, the Bordeaux classification was first introduced. So when we first really got to know these ideas about first, you know, kind of first growths and um, second growths and third growths and, um, you know, Grand Cru classes and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and William MacArthur was actually a New South Wales commissioner. He went over to, um, uh, to Paris to um, oversee it. There were a few others. Um, and there was a tasting of the wines that took place here in Sydney before, um, before um, all the wines were sent to, over to, um, to, um, uh, to Paris. And a lot of those wines, you know, they were all pretty much all New South Wales wines. But it was an important one because it opened the eyes, people's eyes to, to, to the idea that Australia could make some really terrific wines. And there were a lot of observers, um, probably, um, you know, kind of helped along by William MacArthur and, and the discussions he would have had with him over dinner and stuff. Because he was friends of von Liebig and, you know, all the big names at the time. And you started seeing a lot of articles coming out, you know, you know kind of, um, you know, suggesting that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that New South Wales and, of course, later on, the whole of Australia is being the France of the Southern Hemisphere. Which, which put us on the map for European awareness. Totally. And did that lead the way to this large, large export boom? Well, I think we've got to remember Italy. that the gold rush of 1851 uh, was a massive, you know, kind of moment in time. Um, you know, um, when, that, when, that, when that happened, you know, suddenly, you know, Australia, Australia you couldn't really get into Australia unless you... You know, you were invited. It was a bit like going into China, um, uh, you know, it's kind of today. And so they only invited. You know, there was only kind of essential workers that were allowed into New South South Wales and gentlemen farmers with capital, people like Gregory Blacksland, and you know, all of those kind of things. But as soon as the uh, the gold rush, um, you know, kind of 1851 came, this enormous influx of people came in with their shovels and pickaxes with this idea that they were going to, you know, they were going to make their wealth and 
you know, the, 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 the wealth in Victor the Victorian and Goldfield was just phenomenal. And the amount of people coming in was just phenomenal. And of course, you know, some of the colonial vineyards just gave up making wine because they could sell the fruit to, at a premium as fresh fruit because there wasn't much of it. Um, so in a way, it kind of hampered the wine industry uh, momentarily, but, um, but it absolutely changed the whole social face of Australia. And, uh, and, and, you know, the influx of the number of people, you know, suddenly these colonial, um, you know, kind of vineyards could scale up a little bit. Um, and then, of course, with the, the steam age and, you know, the kind of rapid transport, being able to, you know, get to Europe and, you know, kind of move materials at, at a rapid rate, you know, all the economies started to, 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 to move, at a, you know, kind of forward. And, and the wine industry was a real benefit. And then uh, as we hit the, we're going to move forward to the to 70s. early, yeah, I and mean, in 70s and who were the main players in that period? Yeah, well, before, before I do, do that, I should yep. really just quickly, because, you know, there was one big incident that happened, um, which you cannot uh, not uh, call out because it absolutely frames the future of Australian wine. And that is the, um, there was, there were a couple of outbreaks of Iridium uh, that happened early in, in, in the 70s, powdery mildew um, and you know, issues like that, which um, allowed a lot of the colonial governments to start instigating you know, kind of protocols, quarantine and everything like that. Um, but in eight, um, 18, 1877, uh, although it was probably there earlier, 1875, a lot of people think, but it was formally recognised in 1877 was the arrival of phylloxera into Victoria. And this um, caused the colonial governments to um, put in draconian um, quarantine regulations. Uh, in South Australia particularly, it's important because um, we have the largest surviving acreage of early 19th, well, mid 19th century, uh, to early 20th century um, vines in the world by a country, country mark. And that, and that is the, the foundation of, or one of the found, key foundations of um, the modern Australian wine industry going forward, I'd like to say, because I don't think um, the Australian wine industry has harnessed that uh, extraordinary asset um, sufficiently well. And of course- it's one of the important things that's come from this book, hasn't yeah. it? The awareness of that. Has yeah, been. that's right. So, you know, I mean, there's volume two in the middle, um, there's 16 pages of vineyards and their names and what's planted there. It is absolutely phenomenal. And so there's an old, there's a thing called the Old Vine um, Register, I think it's called, uh, in the UK, which is brilliant. And they talk about all these old vines in Georgia and Spain and, you know, the, you know, the, the little that they have in France and make a big deal about it. And they're celebrating their first anniversary and they've got these, um, this massive tasting. And they've got two wines from Australia, Riesling Freak and some tin sheds or something like that. And I'm saying, bloody hell. So it kind of really shows you, you know, that we're just not doing the job properly yeah. because it's just phenomenal. Well, speaking of doing the job of tasting wines and being more aware of them, we might just oh, shit, step into... Yeah, you're meant right. to be we drinking these wines. We might just step into having some yeah, tasting. you're meant to be drinking them. Holy um, like it. So could you just bloody explain hell. which wines they are oh. and why they're on the tables? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're not going to run out now. That's good. Enough. <laughs> no, please do. Um, look, we brought this along. It was advertised that we were doing a tasting, but in fact, um, the, I, I think a tasting would just take um, this whole evening to... It wouldn't be quite appropriate. So these wines, um, my wife and I were making out of uh, the Barossa Valley for 10 years. The Mataro uh, 15 and the 15 Shiraz. So just help yourselves and enjoy them. Um, it's a lovely, it's a lovely vintage, eight years old, under screw cap, been perfect. Uh, and there's some white wine. I don't make any white wine, but I just brought some along just in case somebody only drinks white wine, um, because I know some people that's all they do. And the so labels are yeah. artwork by yeah. Andrew. Yeah. And so yeah, and so all the, the labels are are um, yeah they're um, yeah. So, the, so 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 please enjoy. Um, just two two kind of kind of things. I mean, I mentioned it before with with Busby. You know, Mataro was brought in in the eighteen thirty two with his collection and this fine stock material, probably genetically related to 
But anyway, cheers. Enjoy, enjoy it. There's nothing. You don't have to think about it too much. Swap it down and enjoy it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah cheers. cheers. We'll have a glass after we finish. We will. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's move into the next century. Yeah. Because, we, to, because yeah. there are some good stories past yeah. the 1900s that we'd like to cover. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so we'll just if you've got to yeah, yeah, we'll right. start singing now. <laughs> But uh, we won't go on for too much longer because we can start on Q Q&A, but yeah. going into the next century, yeah. you were just asking, yeah. yeah. Um, so the world, I think the World War I period is, the, is the first, one of the first great turmoils of yeah. that century, and there's, there's some very specific images that we found. Yeah, that, that's right. So, um, yeah, so one of the things I found extremely moving uh, was the research um, surrounding uh, the First World War. You know, when, when Australia federated in, in, in 1901, there were some real great hopes for, for Australia. And one of the reasons actually why federation came about was because of the philosopher threat and rabbits and all that. And it's all mentioned in the book. Um, you know, there was a lot of preliminary, you know, kind of meetings between, you know, colonial governments and stuff like that. And so that was really interesting. And you kind of think, you know, with the federation, all these massive hopes for this country, you know, to be you know, to be on the world stage and all of that kind of stuff. And then comes along the First World War. And uh, there's a book on page nine, uh, in volume two, um, of, uh, and you can just imagine, there's, there's about three or four adults um, in front of a, of a, uh, a wagon um, full of grapes. And there's about 10, 10 kids, um, probably aged about... I don't know, it's between the ages of 8 and 14 or something like that. You can see them all here in the hats and stuff like that. And one of them is a guy called Herbert Walker who became a very famous uh, winemaker um, post-war. And a part of his recollection was, you know, about all these boys. Um, they were all, you know, um, by the time it was 1914, no, well, 1915, um, you know, they were all called up. Or in fact, they were not called up. Every single person who fought in the First World War was a volunteer. There were all volunteers. 60,000 Australian casualties killed um, in the First World War. And out of these 10, um, only three came back. These boys. And I think, um, you know, when you think about, you know, just the, the, um, the amount of, you know, the, the belief in what Australia could be, and you, you know, with the whole colonial side of things, particularly now, you know, with all the, the Aboriginals and saying how evil, um, the colon how colonial people were, and, and there were different times and there were some bad things that were done. But I'd like to think, in mean, one of my, my forebears were, were colonials and, you know, the Rennells, and I'd like to think that my, my great 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 grandfather, John Rennell, and, and his son, Walter Rennell, my great great grandfather, that they were decent people. And, um, you know, I think I found it just very poignant. And, and then also another part of it is, you know, how awful it was for Germans that were of German descent. And they might have been second or third generation Germans. Um, and, you know, the grief and the wholesale, um, you know, kind of um, declaration by the South Australian government to de-Germanize all place names in South Australia. So, um, uh, Clemsic was renamed, it's called Clemsic, thank God, but uh, it was called Gaza, can you believe? And, um, <laughs> and, but there were, there were a lot of uh, you know, other names that were, were put in, and, and when we hear about Dorian, for instance, which is a, a, which is a sub-region of the Barossa, that's named after a First World War general who never ever came to, to, to South Australia. And Birdwood was the same. He was another. He was at Gallipoli. Um, he was a very fine, fine man. But I, I don't think he ever came. came. But uh, the First World War is, is an extraordinary uh, period because um, the Australian ambition was derailed. At a, and, and it took a long time to really get back um, uh, on top again. Yet all these people, like uh, Walter Rennell, um, uh, who lost his son, my great grandfather, father at Gallipoli, uh, in 1915? You know, um, they they were really stoic about it. You know, they said, "Well, we just got to carry on," and that's what they did. Um, but 
uh, there was an enormous amount of grief. It must have been horrendous, the early 1920s. And then, um, you know, what happened was the British government um, uh, wanted to do things to help the empire get back on its feet. And part of that um, was to introduce preferential trade agreements with, their, um, with the empire. Um, and, uh, and that fundamentally changed the course of history for Australian wine. Because prior to that, there had been um, this extraordinary export market for ferruginous uh, red wine that was coming out of um, uh, Barossa, McLaren Vale, and, and Clare Valley, and then in the early 1900s, out of Rutherglen. And the trade was phenomenal. And it was sent in, you know, if you wonder why, you know, the Penfold story is based on hogsheads and hogsheads everywhere, it's that's because that's the, the type of vessel that uh, the red wine was exported to the UK in. And so uh, companies like the Emu Wine Company, um, and then um, Peter Bob, Bon Boyguin from um, you know, Bourgogne. I mean, the, the amount of, of wine that they were selling into the UK, and it was prescribed for do by doctors for, health, for their health-giving properties. Can you imagine if we got that today? It'd be absolutely <laughs> brilliant. But you know, they, they, they don't do that. But then, then and so all of that was table wine, okay? It wasn't, it wasn't fortified wine. You know, so we have this view that we're all fortified wine, and the reason why is because in 1924 they introduced the Export Bounty Act, and the Export Bounty Act um, uh, gave preference to um, to Australian producers uh, to ex uh, you know, so that they could sell uh, cheap fortified wine into the UK um, in preference to the wines coming out of Portugal and Spain. And so all these wineries, Case is a good example in McLaren Vale, you know, had been, you know, making this glorious wine, you know, using this latest, you know, kind of gravity fed, you know, kind of winery, winery, all this kind of stuff, and, and then started producing all this rubbish. But it was it was um, it was you know brilliantly financially lucrative, but it, it, it put back Australia in terms of its reputation, probably by a good 50 years, from, from 1924 to 1984. So it's here. Yeah, 60 yeah, years. It's a dramatic mm. turnaround. Yeah. Um, one of the things, we'd like to keep some time for Q&A, yeah. yeah. but yeah. one of the things I would like to jump into is yeah. the basically the spine of this, the yes. three volumes, yeah. is the canon of Australian wine. Yeah. Yeah, so I, as I was saying to you before, beforehand, you know, the original idea was to uh, build upon... Um, Dr. Max Lakes, you remember Dr. Max Lakes, don't you? That Max. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, his, it was, you know, the idea was to, 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 to build on that. So what I had started was to try and identify all the important wines that have been made in Australia um, from the very get go right up to the present day. And they, they didn't have to be like multi trophy winning wines necessarily, sometimes they were. But there had to be something that stood for what the times represented. When I first started writing this book, I had a fine wine, um, a, a completely fine wine orientation to it. So there was a little bit of remedial work, you know, bringing in things like spinning cone and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, um, you know um, all, all these, these, you know, kind of commercial kind of stuff. But the canon was really just meant to, it, is, it is a spine because it's, you know, every, every bottle tells a story, and those bottles, in each of those, in the spine, in each of the, 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 the actual wines, there is a story behind them. So it starts 1792, um, um, Rose Hill, uh, Dry Red. And, you know, I think most people would think, well, we, we started in, in the 19th century. But the 1792 um, Rose Hill, Dry Red is, is a mythological wine in the sense that we don't absolutely know whether it was made or not. But there is enough convincing evidence to suggest it was. So the first governor of, um, of New South Wales, Arthur Philip, came from a German background. Um, his father was German. And um, I mean, his, his career was, was absolutely fascinating. And on his way back to New South Wales, it is believed that he took bottles of New South Wales wine with him. And some of that landed up in Germany. And there was a letter from a professor, from some academic, writing a note saying, is it true that this wine was made and existed? So it's, it's all there, it's, it's compiled. 
But if that's true, we can say that Australia has a, has, has, you know, we're eight years off, but still we, 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 we start in the 18th century. And I think that's, that's really quite, quite fascinating. But the actual canon itself goes right through. And, um, you know, when I started doing it, I was doing all the easy stuff, like 1962, Penfold in 68, 1971, Grange, uh, a lot of the old Morris and Shane wines going back into the 1940s, um, you know, all of those kind of things. But when you get into the 19th century, the late 19th century, it's pretty difficult because um, a lot of the wine was exported in barrel and all of that kind of stuff. And we're getting a lot of, you know, kind of show results and stuff like that. So the canon it really gives you an idea of the zeitgeist and sentiment of the time, which I think is really quite interesting. So that's really, really what that is here. Yeah, yeah. yeah it is quite an amazing list. Yeah. When, and so there are some vineyards in there as well. In there, that yeah, there's also, you know, it's, look, none of this is perfect, you know. Um, and I'm sure, Michael, you can probably pick up and say, why the hell is this not in here? Um, you know, or whatever. But, um, you know, I've been pretty... I've been pretty loose in terms of if it's worth putting in, I'll put it in. Um, you know, I've got yellow tail in there, which will annoy a lot of people. Um, but there's a good reason for it to be in there. You can read it and find out. And, yeah. But you know, it's it's about being. It's about you know. It's about you know what is right. And I mean, just saying that you know, yellow tail is often accused of being a bit of a nemesis of uh, Australia's fine wine industry. But I would say the ne nemesis is not uh, yellow tail. I think the nemesis is the people who are leading leading the uh, um, you know the, the, the charge and, and and are not well enough equipped um, with the narrative that they should have to be able to put us in the in the centre stage of the fine wine wine world. And I think um, you know a lot of individual wineries are doing it, but as a country, we haven't done a very good job over the last ten years or fifteen years um, uh, for one reason or another. And I think that's an excellent point to turn to questions. Yes. Because we do have some work ahead of us yeah. there. Yes, that's um, true. Does anyone have any questions for Andrew? Yeah. yeah. Yes, I do. Um, first, Andrew, thank you very much for this evening and thank you also for providing some great wines and to help establish your residence. Just terrific. Good. Um, look, uh, at the risk of destroying an apocryphal story that I've been telling for decades, and I'm <laughs> delighted that you go back to the First World War, um, is the, the genesis of Australian sparkling reds. Oh. And the story that was told to me uh, many, many years ago was that when the Australian soldiers were in the trenches in the First World War, that they didn't have anything that they wanted to drink because they were used to beer. So the French said, we'll put bubbles in our red wine. And beer became the Australian sparkling red. Right. Uh, please... Uh, Tell me that that is true or not. Can I just repeat the question just oh. for the purposes for the recording? So it's a question about the origins of Australian sparkling red, and is yeah. it true that that harked back to the trenches days? Yeah. Um, it's really interesting what you have to say because there's a lot of material about, um, you know, that the derivation of the word plonk and where that came from and everything like that. And it's true um, that soldiers were drinking a lot of red wine. It was actually mostly Spanish wine. Um, and um, but in terms of the story of Australian sparkling red wine, it actually goes back much earlier than that. Um, really, yeah, um, I, it goes it goes back to the 18, 1880s, eighteen nineties, and I can't. It's it's in the book, but I can't be specific on it. But um, uh, there was there was sparkling wine being made, and specific wine which is mentioned in the book. Yeah, there were there. It's quite interesting because. You know, we often talk about the Germans coming in, and of course, you know, there were a lot of Germans that went into into um, into um, in South Australia, and um, and there were a lot of Germans that went um, into uh, the Albury Wodonga area making wine, and of course, um, William MacArthur, the MacArthur family, brought a lot of Germans in as well. And, uh, and one of the signs of that, um, the Stein family, you know, got a place in Mudgee. So they all, you know, bring you on today. But there were also quite a lot of French people that came in. And um, uh, one of them was uh, a, a guy called Frank Jardet, who was a Franco-Irishman, uh, who was connected to the Crook family. And, um, and he landed up um, uh, coming out to Australia, selling his assets, 
uh, to his um, cousins, the Kroger family, uh, who also um, uh, gave him a hundred pounds stipend uh, uh, every year until the rest of his life with him and his brother uh, so that they could use the Jaune name and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I mean, he was just one example of a Frenchman that came out and he worked briefly at Great Western and then he went and worked with Shadowton Under and then he disappeared off the face of the earth. But there's, there's, there's a lot of French people that came out and um, I think that you'll, you know, you'll find that um, in South Australia there were a lot of sparkly red wine being made in, in the 1880s and 1890s. Yeah. It's a good story though. I wouldn't, cha I wouldn't change it just because it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the line we've taken in the book. No. Um, do you have any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah. oh. We've talked about, oh, you talked about you know, Australia's wine scene putting itself back about 60 years during the fortified period of just you know, Grenache and those sorts of things. Have you found that we've done that a few times since then, particularly with China being such a big market for us and then snapping shut? I feel like the Australian wine trade's made a lot of wine just for that market. Well, they're doing it again. Yeah. You know, all the rubbish is going up there and it's already going up there. You know, that's some of the reports coming back, which is not, not really good. Um, that's the problem with wine production. You're always trying to find, you know, kind of push your bottles of wine down various rabbit holes because it's so difficult to distribute. And, um, you know, especially with a commercial winemaker, it's um, pretty difficult. Um, you know we're in a, a major pivot. Um, you know, the, all of those inland irrigated areas are, you know, the cost of production has gone up. Um, water resources are uh, becoming more difficult. Um, there are so many um, circumstances that say they've got to pull up their vines and you know, grow something else or, 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 or get out. Um, so the wine industry needs to contract. Um, and the problem with that is that the wine industry has known that it needs to contract for probably a good 10, 15 years, but just hasn't been doing anything. And, and, and China's just been prolonging it. And you've seen that all that stuff done at Penfolds um, at the weekend, and everyone just saying, we're going to get bounce back. All the politicians saying we're going to bounce back and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I think, I think the bounce back will be patchy. Penfolds will do, because Penfolds have been in there, and there was a lot of surplus stock during the, you know, the time. So, you know, it was still moving around, and, you know, they were, they were quite smart. But for just bulk wine, um, it's going to be very difficult. But there's also another issue about China. And that is, you've seen, um, you know, there, there's the, the same problem that we had with tariffs is now looming with, with Europe with brandy, and uh, and France produces something like 95 percent of brandy production in Europe, and so cognac sales and armagnac sales are going to they're going to be slammed with that massive, you know, tax, and the next thing will be, um, you know, kind of French wine, and you know, it's just going to be this this kind of ping pong game that's going and wine being a little pawn in the whole story and so I think you're right I think um, you know the wine industry needs to recalibrate itself and um, we have two industries we have a commercial industry and we have a fine wine industry and they have two different two different objectives um, and the commercial wine industry is always going to um, undermine to some degree the ambitions our fine wine ambitions and that's why we need a stronger voice yeah I'm not sure I answered the question correctly. No, no, I did. Yeah. 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 I had a question down the back. Hi, Andrew. Um, I did want to ask a question about that. I think it's been 60 years. Yeah. I mean, look, in, in, you know, Pimple was doing great stuff in Axman Dog back in the 50s, table wines. Um, yeah. Parambal was booming, you know, we, we had Dowry doing stuff. Yeah. There. What in 1984 changed? From that I arrived. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the question is, what, what changed yeah. in 1984 in the industry? Yeah. When were you there? Um, 86, I guess. Oh, I just missed you. I was uh, I finished up in 84. Um, I was still at school. You were still at school. Yeah. Yeah, well, we have, you know, with a, with a conversation like this, we can, we can talk for, for hours, right? So um, we're trying to keep it kind of short so you don't get bored by it. But, um, you know, the, the whole development of Grange was an absolutely fascinating thing. Okay. Um, 
the, the development of grain could not have happened without the the extraordinary discovery um, of Dr. Ray Beckwith, which is the relationship between pH um, and wine stability. Now, before that, wineries all around the world were selling, were, were throwing out, you know, 25 or 30 percent of their wines because of bacterial spoilage and all that kind of stuff. So, if you actually think because they had those technical problems, you know, fortify, fortifying wine uh, was a way of uh, of being able to sell wines that you know, the stable and all that kind of stuff. And what are you going to remember during the 50s? So you had the development of Grange, um, which was phenomenal. Uh, the story of Grange is, is half myth, half truth. Um, you know, the, the, it is a revolutionary wine, absolutely. It is the most important wine um, of the period, um, and it continues to be the most important wine just in terms of the volume that's around and, and values and all, and all of that. that um, uh, kind of thing. So, you know, Max, Max, Max's um, work um, in producing uh, a, 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 an Australian style of wine. So, you know, prior to Grange, most most wine wasn't aged in in New Oak, right? Mm. They treated the oak before they put it in, and um, and also about selection and the type of wine, you know, kind of fruit that you needed and all that kind of stuff. But what was also happening during the um, post the 50s and 60s, and you had the, all of those experimental wines. I mean, I don't know how often you've tasted wines from the 50s or uh, 60s from Penfolds, but they're pretty bloody good. You know, um, you know they're you know they're they're aged, but they're still fresh. Uh, not all of them um, under cork. Um, you can go in, in different ways, but generally, you know, um, you know the Penfolds wines have stood the test of time. But then, of course, technology starts coming in. You know, you've got all this kind of, you know, we, people were experimenting with cold fermentation before the 70s. But you have all of this new technologies that's coming, coming in. And then this new ambition um, that was starting to take, if you remember in the early 80s, you know, everyone was talking about cool climate viticulture. So everything during, prior to, to really the 80s, up in the 70s, no one was really talking about that stuff. They were just, you know, the Barossa was the center of, of fine wine. Um, the, the Hunter Valley, you know, had this still this extraordinary, you know, reputation as being, you know, the birthplace, if you like, of uh, of modern Australian fine wine. That's what I like to say, but it's not really true. But um, you know, there's all the, you know, all the technologies that start coming in, and also the ambition. So you all think of all the people you were rosewood with, and you know, they they are the, you know, the people who drove drove quality to where to where it is. And so I think in the end, a part of the the reason why it was so exciting. Um, was um, part of the fact that the Europeans rediscovered that Australia could actually make good, you know, dry table wine. So the the um, the visit of the, the uh, Institute of Masters of Wine, I think, it was um, was I think it was eighty five or eighty six while you were at Roseworthy. It was around that time anyway. And at the time, if you were a master of wine, um, you were more likely to be a buyer than an educator. So, you know, that, that really pushed um, exports into the UK at a phenomenal rate. Um, and then the wine show system, you know, uh, I think we have to give credit to, to Len uh, for the work that he did with that and Halliday. Um, and all those, you know, creating, um, okay, creating quality standards and everything like that. And I think also the fact that cheaper air travel, um, more um, connections with... Um, uh, what was happening, you know, kind of winemakers going to the UK and, you know, these kind of um, little, um, you know, Scots and English people, you know, five, five foot six, you know, suddenly all these strapping, you know, kind of well-fed Australians coming, couldn't, they couldn't just believe good-looking Australians coming in and being um, charming and everything. I think that captured everyone's imagination. Um, so, and then the, the rise of the supermarkets, all those kind of things, you know, kind of, raised our boats, so it was technology, people, and time. But one of the things that we did hold back, and which reminds me, um, was uh, the Monty Python yeah. sketch. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Put you back hey, I mentioned, it's really interesting. We tried to get the whole transcript and get authority to get the whole transcript in the book, and they wouldn't allow it. And they wouldn't allow it because they would have been embarrassed again. Um, because it, it's absolutely, I mean, it's fascinating. And if you want to say it's funny, 
Yes, it's not, fun, it's, not, it's not funny from a prism of today. We all thought it was hilarious that, that, that I didn't because I was so proud to be Australian. And, um, but it, it really held back Australia. I, you know, I think our, our export markets and stuff probably would have happened a good 10 years earlier if it hadn't been for that. You know, England, it's a funny place. So probably still, they still think of us as colonials and stuff like that. I mean, it's, you know, this whole thing about our, our old vine stuff, you know, you've got this whole old vine registry that's designed to be able to promote old vines. And they've got bugger all Australian wines in that registry, you know, of vineyards. And, and we'll, we're going to sort that out, by the way, but it, it just shows you, it just shows you that, um, that Europeans are, are, they're like Americans. They don't really see beyond Europe. And Americans don't really see, you know, beyond America, except for the governments and stuff like that. So it's quite interesting. I think we're going to have to, Oh, Is there, yeah. So do you have? Yeah. No, I was going to say the yeah. encyclopedias that you would get, which are mostly produced in Europe or, or the UK, mm. wine encyclopedias. Okay. Yeah. Will dedicate twenty-four pages to Australian wine. Yeah. And it'd be probably fifty pages to a particular region in France. Yeah. Uh, and I think that in itself. You know, is a, is, a, is, a, is a reflection of that. Yeah, but what's also interesting is, you know, how I was saying about p people saying that, that they believe that Australia would be the France of the Southern Hemisphere. If you look at books that were produced in the 1880s and 1890s, it's surprising how many pages are dedicated to Australian wine. It's not much, but considering the times, it's incredible. But, um, you know, this is something that, I really believe in strongly is as an industry, we have to, if we don't believe in ourselves, no one's going to believe in us. And we've got to, we've got to go out there and just say, this is how it is, guys. Yeah, you know, you've been making wines, yep, for thousands of years, but you're making, you're making wines, you know, of vine stock that's only 20 or 30 years old. We're making, we're making, we're making wines of vine stock that's a hundred, over a hundred years old, 150 years old. And the genetic fine stock material goes all the way back to the earliest times. And there's no other country in the world that can do that. And so I think, um, you know, in my view, we're going to see, see, you know, just finishing it off, you know, the wine industry is going to contract. It's going to pre, has to premiumize. Um, our story has not been properly told. And I mean, one of the reasons why I wrote this was because I, I wrote it for the wine industry, um, and you know, for the, for the next generation, so they understand where they come from. Because if you don't understand where you come from, you've got no idea where you're going. And this is the problem with the leadership of the Australian wine industry today: is is that they all know how to run a spreadsheet, they all know how to manage up in a corporate world. Um, most of them have never walked in a vineyard in their lives, or have any idea about a vineyard. Um, not not everyone, but a lot of them. And um, we just need um, a little bit more, we need more wine industry people in the leadership side of our industry to take us forward. But saying that, we've got a wonderful new generation of people coming in who are more knowledgeable, more passionate, um, and perhaps more visionary than, than, than the generations before us. So although we're going to contract, we're going to become known as one of the great um, winemaking um, countries in the world, just as our our um, early pioneers envisaged, uh, envisaged us uh, two hundred years ago. Yeah, well, I think brand managers. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, I mean, I I know a couple of good brand managers, but when you look at some of the stuff that's coming out of you know some of the corporates. And I won't, um, I could, but I suddenly remember when you recorded. <laughs> um, you know, there's some real, there's some real rubbish coming out, you know, kind of rubbish stories and stuff. And, and yet we don't need to come up with that stuff. We've got the greatest story. It doesn't matter how young the industry, you know, you are as a winery, how, or how old your vineyard is, or what you're doing. Everybody, every single winemaker can steep their story into our, into our, you know, kind of 19th century origins. And that's what we should be doing. And saying is our story is much longer, more romantic, more beautiful. And, and accompanied that by that, we're producing some of the most beautiful wines in the world.
That, I mean, I believe that. I've always had believed that. But since doing all the research and, and, and writing that, I'm absolutely convinced that we can do it. And uh, just one last thing. I know you and Len have uh, a disagreement. <laughs> yeah. But the thing I don't see in the industry now, maybe I'm wrong, is people like him and Halliday, who actually, whilst they had their own wineries and their own products, were advocates for the Australian industry as a whole. Yeah. And did that before. I mean, there are great spokespeople for Dimitri, but they all seem to have... Yeah, their they're, all, they, they're, their they're, they're all in little silos here and there. And, and, uh, I, I and that's agree. what I think we're missing. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, looking back at, uh, at, at Len, I mean, Len was an extraordinary human being. And uh, he was... He was extraordinary. Um, you know, Halliday was a, a writer, or is a writer, um, and a, um, but I, I wouldn't call Halliday, Halliday is a, is, he's a scholar rather than, a, I would never call him a leader. Um, Len was a leader, um, uh, for want of a better word, but he was also able to open every single door of the industry. He could knock on the door, you know, um, into Wine Australia, or he could go into, um, you know, South Cork or whatever it was, the Penfolds, and knock them on the head. You know, he, he was a very, very powerful and influential person. And we have not, have, we, that's not replicated. And um, so we are fragmented in that, in, 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 in that regard. Um, and so I do think we're missing, we're missing um, leadership in that, in, in that regard. But also, um, you know, Len really did know, he knew his history as well. You know, I mean, he used to talk about all the generations before him, like George Fairbrother, who's, who's you know, and, and he was at a dinner, and, and George Fair, Fairbrother, you know, um, in his 90s, wizened, you know, um, you know, on his chair, um, and Len Evans referring to him as, you know, the great George Fairbrother, and of course that just washed all over our heads because we had no idea what he'd done before. Um, but, you know, the industry always has had some great people um, within the corporate, you know, kind of I idea, but it is limited. I mean, Peter Gago, for instance, yes. and I've seen him because I've, you know, kind of known that mob for such a long time, and I see see what he's done outside the Penfolds thing, which is great. And then, but you see, you know, if you look at Margaret River, for instance, and the top producers, they are all very collaborative in the way they do things. Barossa does it, but I think it's more of a collaborative, not the individual that's happening right now. Yeah. I don't know how it's all going to pan out. There's a lot more to talk about. There is. We need to. We need a Kaya phone, as yeah. we need, so we can have him in different rooms yeah, talking. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, but, we have spoken for far too long. Thank yeah. you, yeah. Andrew. I think what this gives you is just a taste of the depth of knowledge and passion that Andrew has for the industry. Yeah. And thank you, thank you Andrew. Thank you, David. Thank, yeah. thank you very much. And, and I was sure just to you know point point out with this book. You know, I am the author. But uh, we put together uh, a team, um, and the whole way the book came around was because I was talking about it uh, to Angus, Angus Hewson, who's another wine writer, and he said, why don't we do it together? This was a, a 70th anniversary of, of Penfolds Grange. And when he said that to me, it actually took me back, and I, and I said, really? Do I really want to do it with you? And, um, and in fact, we carried on the conversation, um, and he's been absolutely magnificent. I, I do not know... Um, you know, wine writers are always protective of their own patch. It's very difficult making a living. You know, to be able to have shown that generosity and that energy, and it just keeps going. It's been going on forever. And he, it was a guy who brought in David um, uh, as a as a co-publisher. David had produced a book for Angus at one time, and then uh, and then David brought in uh, an editor uh, called Siobhan Gallagher, who he's never met, but I've actually met, who lives in France and Spain. She's half Irish, half American, and she's never been to Australia. And that was brilliant for me because I'd done a book, um, uh, The Last Penfolds Rewards of Patients, um, with a publisher, which you probably all know about, but I'm not going to tell you who they are. And I, it was such a, it was like I was in, I, I felt as I was re in a wrestling match for, for six months, and I said, I never want to do this again. And it was just a beautiful um, experience, everyone on the same page. And then we had this, Young woman called Tiana Lagerman, who's based in um, 
in South Australia who did a lot of legwork for helping, you know, kind of find all the pictures and stuff like that. We spent over thirty thousand dollars just alone in IP and stuff like that. I mean, you know, it was really no holds barred on on the financials on this. So yeah. anyway, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you all for your yeah. Thanks so much for coming. Yeah. Ask you all to please give another round of applause. Thank you.